Welcome to another installment of Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Rosebro. I am your servant in Jesus Christ. This is the channel that compares what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God. Now, one of the things, if you haven't really noticed, is that what this program really is about is about how awesome God's Word is. The real stories in Scripture are far better than the mutilated, butchered, versions, uh, you know, retellings that don't really address the real substance of scripture that you hear from so many who call themselves pastors or vision casting leaders or things like this. And so the idea here is I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get you hooked on the Word of God, rightly taught. And so when we do comparative work, it's, you know, you'll know it. I like picking people to kind of riff against, you know, people who are twisting up the Scripture. But ultimately, it's about the Bible teaching that you're going to hear, because when you compare what I'm going to show you, when you put the Bible back in context, you don't butcher it, you don't twist it, you don't manipulate it. And since all the Scriptures are pointing us back to Christ— that's exactly what they're doing, uh, that you can see then all of the Bible makes sense, including the Old Testament. And so today we're going to be listening to a woman that I don't really like listening to. I find her to be just grating. Uh, and the issue here is, is that you're going to note that when you disobey God and you disobey him by going against what he has written in his word, you are cutting yourself off from hearing God's word rightly taught. So we'll note that uh, Real Talk Kim is not qualified to be a pastor. Biblically, women are not permitted to be pastors. She clearly hasn't studied and showed herself approved as a workman who need not blush with embarrassment, who can rightly handle the word of truth. Instead, she she kind of bumbles along looking for some kind of relevant message that she thinks that the texts are about, but they're not. And she's not alone in doing this. This is the common practice of today's megachurch pastors, many evangelical pastors, uh, those in the NAR and other places. And when you disobey God, God has made it clear, a, a pastor has to meet particular theological and moral obligations before he's qualified to teach in Christ's church. When you circumvent those qualifications and you put the unqualified in place uh, to teach you, they're going to lead you astray. They are going to rob you of the real gold that is in Scripture, and they're going to ingratiate themselves. This is just how it works. Uh, you can't expect a bad tree to bear good fruit. Christ makes that perfectly clear. So all of that being said, we're going to whirl up the desktop. Yeah, things are warming up here in uh, North Dakota and Minnesota, but I thought a winterscape would be a good... <clears throat> good uh, thing to show here, uh, just because of Jadis. But that that's, if you don't know what I mean, great. If you know what I mean, you get what I mean. So all of that being said, we're going to take a look at a uh, recent sermon delivered by Real Talk Kim. <sighs> and we're going to note, this woman is, is hurting herself, and she's hurting the people that she's been hired to serve by not rightly handling God's word. She's going to be preaching on the story of Hannah, and the name of the uh, of the sermon is Players and Pretenders, My Delay is Not Denial. And this is a master class in <laughs> just mumbo jumbo, uh, not a master class in rightly handling God's word at all. And, and so I, I feel terribly uh, for her. I feel terribly for the people that are listening to her. But this episode should demonstrate this woman has no business. And I mean this. If she has any fear of God in her, she needs to repent and she needs to step down. She's hurting herself and others. And so all of that being said, let's uh, let's take a look at uh, this particular mess, edge, emphasis on the word mess. And so today I want to title this because we're in Players and Pretenders. Have you loved this? Players and Pretenders. Today I'm going to title this, My Delay is Not Denial. <laughs> My Delay is Not Denial. Mm. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, oh, I'm back. 
They're like, oh, girl, I heard this before. Right? Because we the queen of I, 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 I am not ever in the next 10 minutes. Okay. Right? My de- delay is not denial. I want to go from 1 Samuel 1, 1 through 10. All right. So you're going to note here, she's going to engage in eisegesis. She started with what she thinks this is about. She's re- she's already inserted the thought into their mind. She's not exegeting at all. Uh, and you're going to note, she's going to demonstrate she has zero qualifications to be teaching at all because she can't, she can't, she's never studied Hebrew. She's never studied Greek. She has no clue how to even pronounce the names of the Old Testament. First Samuel 1, 1 through 10. And we're going to talk about today a pretender and a player. 1 through 10. You cannot take a look at the story of Hannah and only focus on 10 verses. Mm. Can't be done. That lived in the same house. <gasps> that some of y'all work next door in the cubicle to this person. Some of y'all were raised by this person. <laughs> No, none of the people mentioned in 1 Samuel are f- physically alive on planet Earth at the moment. Oh, God. So she's allegorizing the players and the pretenders, so-called, from the story of Hannah. But I'm going to make you feel better. No, not possible. The only thing that would make me feel better right now, real talk, him, is if you really repented, really resigned. Because there's always a reason why you've encountered the things you've encountered. And it was for such a time as this. Ah, twisting the book of Esther here. Stop wasting your testimony. Uh. Well, Lord knows I've been tea to everybody. Everybody talking about my tea. Well, they didn't realize that your tea was your testimony. Right? Listen, let's talk about this. There was a man named Elkanah who lived in Ramai in the region of Zuf. <laughs> In the hill country of Ephraim. He was a son of Jehoram, son of Eluhu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf of Ephraim. Why? Just why? Why? Just why? Why are you standing there teaching these people? You clearly have no clue what you're doing. Can y'all hear that, Mama? Rama! Elkanah! No mama of the ancient world, including ancient Israel, would have ever invoked their child's name by reciting their ancestors in order. Okay. Or. Tohua, Iluhua, get your butt in this house. Yeah. Cringe is the word that comes to mind. Listen. Son of Zuf of Ephraim, Elkanai had two wives. <laughs> I love what the closed captioning is doing with this. Hannah and Pina. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Pina had children. Do you like Pina Coladas getting lost in the rain? But Hannah. <sighs> Living in the same house, Whew, I'm building you a story. The scriptures have already built us stories. You're butchering it and building your own. I'm building you a story. Each year, Elk and I would travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of Heaven's armies at the tabernacle. The priests of the Lord at that time were the two sons of Eli, Ophani and Phinebus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is utterly, utterly tragic and ignorant. On the days Elk and I presented his sac- By the way, who, who is responsible for um, launching this woman, this pink virus on the body of Christ? T.D. Jakes. T.D. Jakes is responsible for this. He would give portions of the meat to Pina and each of her children. And though he loved Hannah, he would give her only one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. Y'all, I ain't even, I ain't, I'm, listen, I was, I was studying this sermon getting mad for her because you know that's how we women are. I was like, what? It ain't her fault. I mean, I'm talking back to the story. She can't have kids, so she only gonna get half. So Peter would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the 
Lord had kept her from having children. Year after year, it was the same. Pina would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. Each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask. That's her husband. He would say, Hannah, why are you crying? Why aren't you eating? Duh. You only gave me half. I'm, I'm answer for her. Boy. Yeah, dangerous here. Again, um, real talk, Kim should not be doing what she's doing. Bye. Don't you see she sees she ain't getting what he... Right. I go straight up savage. He goes, why are you eating? Why are you so downhearted? Is it just because you don't have children? This next part. You have me. Ain't that enough? Having me, isn't that better than having 10 sons? Once after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli, the priest, was sitting at his customary place behind the entrance of the tabernacle. Hannah was deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow. Honey, listen to me. When a woman of God gets sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that's what's not going on in this text at all. Oh, we don't need an audience. We don't need no makeup. We don't need no, 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 no enforcement. When we get sick and tired, that's, that's why the enemy makes you get worn out because you ain't got strength to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. This story isn't about you. Oh, but Hannah. Hannah went in to prayer and she made a vow. She said, oh Lord, I can hear right now. Oh, she got the grumble. Oh Lord of heaven armies, if you will look upon my son. Nothing mentioned about a grumble here. And answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. And he will be yours for an entire lifetime. And guess what, y'all? Guess what happened? Huh? What happened? He gave her Samuel. But how long did she have to go through this before she saw this miracle manifestation? She had to be picked on for a while. Why? Because she was getting her testimony. They ain't nothing like being crushed. So God crushed her to give her a testimony. Says no biblical text anywhere. So let's pause here and give ourselves a little bit of a breather. Aside from the grating vocals here, the, uh, the color palette she's chosen here is, I feel like it's doing violence to my eyes. So let's note a few things here. We're going to note first, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, there are six notable women who could not bear children uh, and, and eventually did. They are Sarah. So in, uh, in Genesis 11, it says of Sarai before she, God changed her name. Now, Sarai was barren. She had no children. Rachel, the, uh, the wife of Isaac. Genesis 25, Isaac prayed to Yahweh for his wife because she was barren, and Yahweh granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Leah, uh, when the Lord saw Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. You'll, you'll note a little bit of a thing going on here uh, as far as like, you know, between the, uh, the baby war that occurred with Leah and Rachel, and then Rachel herself was barren. Uh, until God opened up her womb. And Hannah is another one. Manoah's wife, the, the uh, mother of Samson, uh, there was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites whose name was Manoah. His wife was barren and had no children. And then you got the, uh, the account of the Shunammite woman, uh, you know, where uh, Elisha, uh, oh, you, know, you know, gives her, uh, you know, uh, it was Elijah, I think. It was, a, hang on a second here. One day, Elisha. Nope, I got it right. Elisha. So the Shunammite woman who wasn't able to bear, and then she receives a son. And the, the question comes up, what is with this recurring theme of women who are barren? Is this just sh showing historically the statistical probability of experiencing barrenness as uh, and uh, you know the ancient world didn't have fertility doctors and this is just part of human history it's a lot more than that 
and uh, we're going to note here that uh, in uh, Galatians chapter 4, uh, it gives us an interpretation of what is going on here. And, uh, and an important text along these lines is going to be quoted here is Isaiah 54, sing, O barren one who did not bear, and break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says Yahweh. So there's something going on, and you're going to know God is the one who opens wombs, and all of these miracles are pointing to something. So in the, in the case of uh, Sarah and Hagar, uh, Gal- uh, Paul writes in Galatians 4, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. So uh, a birth through a promise, that's an important theme here in Scripture. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically, and Paul is doing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem. She is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of one who has a husband. Now you brothers, like Isaac, you are children of promise. And so you can see here, there's a theme here of a child of promise being born to a woman who's desolate. And this is where we must note that there is more, no more desolate of a womb than the womb of a virgin. And this also has implications as it relates to the virgin birth of Christ. So you'll note with Sarah, with Rachel, with, uh, you know, with Leah, with Hannah, with Manoah, with the Shunammite woman, there's a recurring theme of barren women who bear a child, and all of that is pointing us to the miracle of the virgin birth of Jesus. And when we take a look then at the story of Hannah, we're, I'm going to point this out. We're going to read a large swath of this. In fact, you know, uh, we're going to read full, full chapter one, probably half of chapter two, and we're going to see then that there's a structure that is going on here that is repeated in the Gospel of Luke, and, and you'll see this. So this has tie-ins to Christ, and uh, and the woman in question, Hannah, um, she has a New Testament counterpart, and when you see it, you can't unsee it. So all of this is pointing to something regarding Jesus and preparing us for the big birth that's going to take place where the barren woman, the virgin, bears Jesus Christ. Hannah, the barren woman, is going to bear uh, one of the most important Old Testament prophets, kind of first Old Testament prophet of his kind. Uh, So Moses was a prophet for sure. Then Then you get the judges, and then you've got Samuel. He's the first of the Old Testament prophets of his particular type, and he plays an important role. And then Jesus, who is prophet, priest, and king, he's all of three. Uh, He's born of the Virgin Mary. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's take a look at the actual account. There was a, a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elehu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. The other, uh, the other, the name of the other was Peninnah. Peninnah had children. Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice sacrifice to Yahweh of hosts. Now, I do think that's interesting here. So, Sava in uh, in the Hebrew is, is armies, and so some of our modern English translations will take the word Sava and translate it as armies. If you have an English translation like the ESV, and it says, Lord of hosts, uh, Yahweh of armies is, uh, is probably a better translation. Fascinating that that's what's invoked here, though, because um, there's no presenting issue as it relates to God, you know, taking up his army host. And so, fascinating. So, to sacrifice to Yahweh of armies at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of, the, of Yahweh. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though Yahweh had closed her womb. So, 
the portions that this is talking about then is the portions that they got to have of the sacrifice. So you'll note when, if you read the book of Leviticus in particular, you'll note that all the different sacrifices uh, that someone would bring, they actually got to participate by eating a part of that sacrifice. A large portion of the animal was uh, was used to, and consumed there on the spot. Some of it was given to the priests uh, so that they can feed themselves and their families. And you're going to note here that uh, Penina and you know he, he uh, so he would give portions to Penina and that, but to Hannah he gave a double portion and so Hannah got twice as much as Penina uh, and the reason why is because Elkanah loved her though Yahweh had closed her womb and I, I might end up going back because if I'm remembering real talk Kim she she may have got this backwards. We'll, we'll fact check that. And uh, and so her rival then used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because Yahweh had closed her womb. And this is this is egregious behavior. This is this is absolutely abusive. Uh, what Penina was doing, um, this is not physical uh, harm to Hannah, but instead in in provoking her and inflicting psychological harm. Very harsh with her. This is cruel. So. It went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of Yahweh, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? And this may not be the the, the most wise thing to say to a woman who's being provoked uh, by a rival wife. That's you know, so, but he, he's meaning well, and he absolutely loves his wife. Now, regarding suffering, you know, and this this kind of invokes something that we as Christians need to pay attention to, and that is, is that, uh, that we as Christians are called also to suffer in our lives. This is a clear teaching of Scripture. I'm not reading this into here. I'm seeing this as an example of the suffering that we Christians go through. And this isn't about God creating us in us a testimony. That's not it. Suffering has a purpose. Purpose that God works in us. But uh, we're going to note uh, uh, 1 Peter 2, uh, Peter writing to slaves. Uh, and he says this, Slaves, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and to the gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. That is the same in the Old Testament, by the way, too. It is a gracious thing even for Hannah. She's suffering unjustly at the, at the hands of a cruel uh, uh, a, a, of a cruel member of her own family, you know, the other wife of her husband. For what credit is it if when you sin, you are beaten for it and you endure? But if when you do good and you suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return when he suffered he did not threaten but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed for you were straying like sheep but you have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls and so what does Peter do he invokes the sufferings of Christ Christ too was reviled and he suffered and he did nothing wrong and we can see then that in the story of Hannah, Hannah has done nothing wrong. This is not uh, her fault that she's not able to, able to bear children, and yet she's being provoked and mistreated, and she's suffering. And note what she's not doing. She's not lashing back. She is not exacting revenge. She is not pushing back against Penina and saying, how dare you, woman, you know, and to, or anything. It, you know, instead, she's entrusting her, herself to, to God who sees what's going on here. And this is a story where you'll note that the woman, Hannah, um, in some ways 
is a, a little bit of a Christ figure because she is suffering unjustly and she doesn't seek justice. She entrusts herself to God in the same way that Jesus did. And you'll note, we have a clear passage of, of scripture that tells us that when we suffer unjustly for doing good, this is a gracious thing in the eyes of God. And Christ is held up as the perfect example of that. And Hannah has some really deep spiritual maturity. Uh, where she is trusting the Lord. She doesn't despair, but she's suffering horribly, and this keeps happening year after year after year after year. So note here, there's, there's a theme that you can pick up here, and suffering produces perseverance or endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. God oftentimes is doing something through our suffering in strengthening our faith so that we can endure, right? So the story then continues for Samuel 1. So after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of Yahweh, and this would be the tabernacle. She was deeply distressed, prayed to Yahweh, wept bitterly. So she's not lashing out in anger against Peninnah. She's now bringing her petitions to God. And she vowed a vow and said, O Yahweh of armies, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to Yahweh all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. And so she basically is asking for God to remove the reproach that she's experiencing as a result of the fact that she has not been able to bear a child. And, and, you know, and in really good, wholesome, you know, motivation says, you know, you know uh, even the son that you give me, if you give me a child, I'm going to dedicate that child to you. It's not, not for myself. You can have my child. Just please take this reproach for me. That's a good way to understand the prayer. And so she's uh, offered to dedicate him to the Lord. No razor shall touch his head, uh, making him a Nazarite. You know, uh, you know, you get the idea. So she, she continued praying before Yahweh. Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, but o- only her lips moved. And her voice was not heard. Then Eli took her to be a drunken woman. Now, a little bit of an aside here. The, the, there are some in the Word of Faith heresy that teach that we that God can only act but if we speak things. We have to actually speak. Hannah here has not prayed out loud. She has prayed within her heart, and God hears her prayer. So you do not have to pray out loud. You can pray inside of your heart or inside of your head, and, the, and God hears you. So you don't need to worry about that. It's absolutely false that God will only answer prayers that he hears hears verbally, and therefore you must speak them. That's not true. So therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. Hannah answered, oh no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before Yahweh. Does not Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman for all along. I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and my vexation. And so, no, she's seeking God to remedy the suffering she's going through. That's exactly what Peter told us to do, right? Entrusting ourselves to the one who hears and sees. So Eli answered, you will go in peace, and the God of Israel, may he grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said to him, let your servant find favor in your eyes. And the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. So they rose early. So after praying, you know, she's, she's no longer sad. She's, I trust the Lord. I laid this all out to him. I'm going to just carry on. So they rose early in the morning, worshiped before Yahweh. Then they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. And Yahweh remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked for him from Yahweh. The man Elkanah and all of his house went up to offer to Yahweh the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him, so that he may appear in the presence of Yahweh and dwell there forever. 
Pure in the presence of Yahweh dwell there forever. Interesting. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Well, do what seems best to you, but wait until you have weaned him. Only may Yahweh establish his word. So the woman remained, nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of Yahweh at Shiloh. And the child was young. And then they slaughtered the bull. So note, Samuel is now brought into the tabernacle and presented to the Lord. Pay attention to that, right? So they slaughtered the bull. They brought the child to Eli, and she said, Oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence, praying to Yahweh. For this child I prayed, and Yahweh has granted me my petition that I made to him. The Lord has granted it, right? Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to Yahweh, and he worshiped Yahweh there. And let me add a little bit of more here. So then you're going to note here, watch what happens. Hannah's prayer. Hannah prayed and said, my heart exalts in Yahweh. My horn is exalted in Yahweh. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. And so note here, she's She's seeing that God has vindicated her, and she rejoices in Yahweh, and you're going to know, by God granting her petition, she has been vindicated against Peninnah, who had been provoking her and treating her so terribly, and God has removed the reproach of barrenness from her, right? So, So, my mouth derides my enemies. Why? Because I rejoice in your salvation. She sees this answer to her prayer as a type of salvation. Hmm. I can think of another barren woman who bore a son and it really resulted in our, in our salvation. We keep going there. There is none holy like Yahweh, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For Yahweh is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble they bind on strength. And so here we see a great theme of, of the weak and the oppressed and the trodden down. And you know the humble and the feeble, they are given strength while the mighty are broken. Those who are who are who are full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. Now Hannah's only born one, but she is prophesying here, and her words are recorded in Scripture. Yahweh kills, and he brings to life. He brings down to Sheol, and he raises up. Yahweh makes poor, and he makes rich. He brings low, and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit the seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are Yahweh's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of Yahweh shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. Yahweh will judge the ends of the earth, and he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Oh, wow. Look at that. Hannah prophesied about Jesus. And so you'll note that there's a there's a, a kind of a literary pattern here. The barren woman conceives miraculously. God remembers and hears a prayer. The barren one conceives, and then the barren one, what? Praises God, and those those the song of praise ends up being recorded in the scripture. So we continue by going now to Luke, where we can see the fulfillment of the type and shadow. In Luke chapter 1, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. And now we're going to get another barren woman. Six notable barren women, Old Testament. New Testament, two notable barren women, Elizabeth and Mary. 
So in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. He had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in the commandments and statutes of Yahweh, or of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. Here we go again. This is the fulfillment now of the type and shadow. Both were advanced in years. So was Abraham and Sarai. We, we know these themes. And while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. For your prayers have been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Ah, all right. So, Nazarite, uh, Nazarite, the details here regarding John the Baptist, who is the forerunner of Christ. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people who are prepared. Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am old, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and you will be unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when this, his time of service was ended, he went to his home. And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked upon me to take away my reproach among the people. Note Elizabeth experienced that same reproach that Hannah experienced, and God removed that reproach from her as well. And you'll note, takes place in the temple. You know, there's so many things going on here that just bring the Old Testament text and the promises of the Messiah start crackling and start moving and teeming and vibrating with life. Something big is about to take place. So in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, same angel, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, let's, let's take a look at an important biblical text in this regard. Genesis chapter 3 is going to be helpful here. And so when the Lord is punishing Adam and Eve and the serpent for the transgressions that they have all committed. It says this when God is punishing the serpent. Yahweh Elohim said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. It's singular seed of a woman. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And so here we have a promise, the promise from God that he would send the seed of a woman who would crush the head of the serpent to set us free from his dominion. And so when we consider what's going on here, you know, what happened in the Old Testament, these six notable women who experienced barrenness and eventually were able to conceive, uh, Sarah, Rachel, Leah, Hannah, Manoah's wife, and the Shunammite, these are all preparing us for the seed of a woman, the barren womb of a virgin, and bearing us as Hannah prophesied, a savior. That's what's going on here. As God gave as a promise when he cursed the serpent, 
Uh, so the promise has been laying dormant since Adam and Eve, and now it's coming to life. So in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from, a, from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Again, not, not a throwaway detail that Mary's uh, betrothed husband is Joseph. Okay, big person in the Old Testament. And the virgin's name was Mary. All right, Mariam. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Yeshua, right? And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the Most High will overshadow you, therefore the child to be born to you will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let, may, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now in those days, Mary arose and went with haste to the hill country of a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary. And the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women. Blessed it is the fruit of your womb, and why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Now, a little bit of a note here. This is a text that clearly teaches that humans are humans, that we are alive and uh, and uh, you know before we are born, we are human, and we are to be protected. Uh, from the time of our conception until the time of our natural death. Because you're going to note, the lumps of tissue do not leap for joy. Only human beings do. And here John the Baptist, filled with the Holy Spirit, as Gabriel prophesied that he would be. And you'll note that uh, lumps of tissue are not filled with the Holy Spirit, but human beings are. And this human being, John the Baptist, in the womb, leaps for joy, is filled with the Holy Spirit. His mother is prophesying. It's a big deal. This proves that life begins at conception, not at some arbitrary place like, you know, birth, right? So blessed is he... Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And note, Mary's doing the same thing that Hannah did, prophesying in verse, if you would. My soul magnifies the Lord. This is called the Magnificat. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. He has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Note the same themes that Hannah was prophesying. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones. He has exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things. The rich he has sent empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Same theological theme. Same literary parallel here. The barren one bears, sings a song. The barren one bears, sings a song. Or is, you see, it's, it's all going on here. This is what Hannah is about. Hannah is about Christ. She is preparing us for Luke chapters 1 and 2. And here's the little bit of a note here. God remembers Hannah in chapter 2 of Luke. Uh, <clears throat> let me pay let, we'll pay you a little bit of an attention here. Once you see it you cannot unsee it, right? So Zechariah finally he uh, so uh, Elizabeth 
bears John the Baptist, Zechariah prophesies. We're going to go above and beyond right here. And then we have the birth of Christ, you know, told in Luke chapter 2. Um, I'm going to jump ahead, though. We're all familiar with this account from the, from the Christmas stories. So, uh, you know, Mary treasured up all these things in her hearts after the angels sang and the shepherds came and visited and pawned them. All right. At the end of eight days, when Jesus was circumcised, he was called Yeshua. That's actually his Hebrew name. The name given given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, or the Messiah. So he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people. Israel. This little uh, prophetic song is now, uh, in, you know, in the uh, in the church's uh, use in what's called the Nuc Dimittis. All right, if you know if you know your historical, uh, you know, ancient liturgy, you'll know that this is uh, a very important uh, song that is sung as part of the liturgy when you have the Lord's Supper. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many, and a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that, that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And then watch this. There was a prophetess, Anna. Her Hebrew name is Hannah. The Greek transliteration is Anna. There in the temple, when Christ is presented, there is a prophetess named Hannah. That's her name. And you're going to note something here, a little bit of a parallel. This is an homage. This is an, 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 an homage to the prophetess Hannah of the Old Testament. She did prophesy of Christ, and her words are recorded in Scripture, are they not? And here... You know, God remembers, God remembers Hannah, and there's a woman by the name of Hannah. This is her Hebrew name, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband for seven years from when she was a virgin and then as a widow until she was 84. So it looks as if she also was barren. And she lost her husband seven year, years into her marriage. And she was a widow for the rest of her life. Huh. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer day and night. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak to him of all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And so Hannah's of the Old Testament, her son is born and it's salvation from, for her from her reproach. The Hannah, who is an homage, you know, a tie-in back to the Old Testament Hannah, the, the Hannah of the New Testament here in Luke 2, uh, she gets to announce to us uh, our salvation, our redemption, the reproach of sin and the dominion of darkness removed from us, the mighty Satan being cast down from his throne, and we who are humble and lowly being exalted. All right? So all the tie-ins to Christ are just amazing. And a careful study of God's Word, or a pastor who is rightly called, who is qualified according to the biblical qualifications to be a pastor, who is able to point this to you, is able to bring out the gold in this, in this account. And you're going to note, there is a marked difference now between what I've shown you from Scripture and this. I feel like I need to stretch so I don't pull my 
<laughs> so I don't pull a muscle. I'm going to back up. I because I, so I'm at six minutes and twenty two. I'll I'll see if I can fast forward, but I want to back up a little bit because remember as she was telling the story, um, I I I think she may have gotten it wrong, but I um. I, I, I want to check something here. I presented his sacrifice. He would give portions of the meat to Pina and each of her children. And though he loved Hannah, he would give her only one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. Y'all, I- okay, so the, I think this is an issue regarding the, uh, the New Living translation. I think the error is on the part of the New Living. Um, the ESV, I think, correctly gets what's going on here in... Um, in the story of Hannah, as it relates to the fact um, uh, to Hannah, he gave a double portion. Um, off here um, definitely does mean double, and so uh, you know. So I think the New Living Translation. I think they're in error here. Let me just do a quick comparison. I'll just take a look at the NASB. Got to make that readable though. Um, let's see here. But the Lord closed her womb. Hannah, he would give a double portion. Yeah, the NASB sees it. Uh, let's take a look at the old NIV, see what they, you know, how they translate it. Um, to Hannah, he gave a double portion. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, off mana, this is this is a double portion. That's just how that works. So, um, I, you know, all right. So, she did get it wrong, but honestly so, because the New Living Translation is just not that great of a translation. All right. Glad we've kind of figured that out via fact checking. But let me back up now and uh, go back to where we were. And let's see what she does with this account. Ain't nothing like being crushed. Y'all, there ain't nothing like walking through hell and laying in your bed at night and crying and people picking on you and people believing what other people are saying, what the penis are saying about you. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, I don't think I want to touch that. Just note that uh, there's something there that's... Her, her mispronunciation of the names has come back to haunt her. And the <sighs> pretender looks favored while the player is getting nothing? you got to feel this woman. Not only can she not produce. Back in those days when you couldn't give somebody a kid, that's what a woman was for, to birth life. And it says in the word... Yeah, that's still... Biologically, we're made to procreate. God, that, that Jesus... Closed her womb. Closed her womb. And yet Hannah go have boy, girl, boy, girl, girl, boy, girl. What? what? And mean as a snake. It, Penina, yeah. And this woman had to go sit in a place where she couldn't help it. Some of y'all are here. Yours might not be having a kid, but it's being left after 38 years of marriage. It's raising, yes. So you can amen me. You walked it. You gave and you gave and you gave. You served and you were selfless. Only to lay in your bed at night and say, God, where are you? Now, she's touching on the actual suffering that, we're, that we as Christians experience in this lifetime. She's actually on one of the themes of this text. And the one I pointed you out from 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's see what she does with this. I did everything right. No, we don't. None of us do. And where are you in my situation? Yeah, that's something we experience as Christians for sure. I am here to assure you as long as you are on the path of righteousness, even though there are people who are prettier than you, have a better background than you, even, uh, listen, they even got more friends than you. They dress better than you. They're more beautiful than you. Listen, if you are right before God. How are we made right before God? Only by the shed blood of Christ. If you keep your heart right, now we're into legalism. This is where he gets us, ladies. In our hearts. He hurts our hearts. The enemy comes in and gets our heart posture. Because if we get cold, we don't know how to go in travail. Our power is in travail. No, Christ's power is made perfect in our weakness. Our power is in travail. Our power is when we get sick and tired. 
No, our strength is in Christ. Our strength is in God, our Savior, our Deliverer. When you don't know where your kid is, when you don't know what's going to happen next, when you can't control the outcome, that's when God steps in and God will always, always restore if your heart stays right. No, not in this lifetime. God does not promise that he will always restore in this lifetime. And you'll know if your heart stays right. So note, she's making promises for God that are not in the scriptures. You know, I, again, point out the Hannah of the New Testament in Luke chapter 2. She lost her husband after being married for seven years and then was a widow until she was 84. God didn't restore a new husband to her. And yet she had great faith. She trusted in God. And God will eventually restore our fortunes to us in the world to come, in the new earth. But I don't think that's what uh, <clears throat> Real Talk is talking about here. And my question to you today, maybe just maybe, the reason God isn't opening the doors like I'm talking about today is because he's trying to get your heart right. You did it right. You were faithful. <sighs> if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You were handed something you couldn't help. It was out of your control. And now you're paying for it. You should sit at the country club. All those people, all those friends... The minute you got divorced, you can never walk in that place again. You were that job for 38 years. You gave and gave only for them to remove you and walk you out by your arm. This is, this is Hannah. It's real. God will always vindicate the ones that keep their hearts right. And if it ain't happened yet, it's because he's busy working the details out behind the scenes. Yeah, you you got the theme right, but you got the conditions wrong. And that's the dangerous bit about all of this, is because God did work behind the scenes by sending us Christ, the son of a virgin, the most barren womb of all, in order to save us who are suffering and languishing under the dominion of darkness. And we are told by Christ to expect in this life suffering now, sorrows and persecution, difficulty, and to trust him who vindicates, trust ourselves to God and he will vindicate, and to keep ourselves in the faith the faith that Christ is sufficient and enough, that Christ has bled and died for our sins, that he was the one who was perfectly faithful for us, so that we who are not perfectly faithful and are far from righteous can be reckoned as righteous and receive from God the things that Christ has earned for us and gives them to us as a gift. Big difference altogether. And unfortunately, this is what happens when... You disobey the word of God. She is outright standing in defiance against the clear instructions of God's word. Not only her, but this entire congregation. You hear me? Here's what I pray for Limitless. That we have a bunch of men and women in this place that know how to hit the throne room of heaven. That we are not moved by what's happening around us. That we don't let what's happening around us get in us. Prayer is an important thing, but denying reality is not what we're called to do. Pina had children. She had sons and daughters. While Hannah was desperate for just one. So what do you do when things are going well for your adversaries? What do you do when it seems... You pray for your enemies. That's what we're called to do. It's like you take one step forward and all the steps back. What do you do when you're a player, but the pretender in your life seems to be getting all the favor? Pray. Pray for them. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Let's see here. I think I need a New Testament text. Is it Romans 13? I think it's 13. Hang on a second. Submission to authorities. Okay. Hang on a second here. I'm going to look for enemies. 
and I don't want gospels. I want epistles. All right. God, but I forgot election there. Okay, you must rain. Um, let's see here. Still trying to figure this out. You know, the old photographic memory is getting a little fuzzy, but um, I think I want um, pray for those. Okay, let me see here. We're going to do a New Testament search. Here we go. Pray for those who persecute you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. These are the words of Christ, right? All right. So, um, yeah, pray for those who persecute you. Bless those. And then heaping coals. Hang, hang on a second. I'm looking for the word coals. And Romans 12. All right. So here we go. All right. What do we do? All right. Paul says this, repay no one evil for evil. This is Romans 12. But give thought to do what's honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Leave it to the wrath of God. It is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, be, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. All right. So keep that in mind. Hang on a second here. There we go. Desperate for one child. Get forward mm. and all the steps back. What do you do when you're a player, but the pretender in your life seems to be getting all the favor? Here was Hannah. Desperate for one child, while Pina had four without ever praying for a child. You need to tell yourself this right now, out loud. There is a reason for my delay. Come on, say it. Come on, come on, come on, man of God. Come on, woman of God. There's a reason for my delay, delay, and it is not denial. You don't know that. So many lessons that we can learn in this story. Here's number one. Here's a lesson that we get out of this story. You can have emotion. But don't let your emotion have you. What? <laughs> Woo! Mic drop. Not. <laughs> Even they're all. <laughs> don't let your emotion have you. There's nothing wrong in being emotional. But there's everything wrong if your emotions are consuming you. Uh. you gotta ask yourself, am I operating out of pain from my past? Y'all, this is something I have to ask myself every day. And now we're into group therapy. I think you get the idea. So this is what happens when you disobey God. God has made it clear. There are qualifications to be a pastor. She doesn't meet them. As a result of it, she is the blind leading the blind. And they're all falling into the pit together. And the sad part is they're going through the motions. They're going to church. They're, they're you know, claiming that Jesus is their Lord and Savior all the while while disobeying them. And as a result of their disobedience, they're not being rightly taught God's word. That's the sad and tragic part about all of this. And so what, what needs to happen here? Repentance. That's the thing that needs to happen. Uh, and I don't think Real Talk Kim will ever repent of the fact that she's doing what she ought not to be doing. So anybody who's attending this so-called church called Limitless, they, they need to put some limits on it and walk away and find a good congregation where the pastor rightly is called, is qualified to be so theologically and morally, according to the requirements of Titus chapter 1, and, uh, and is feeding his sheep and caring for them as Christ has called them to, rather than deceiving them and sending them out on an ro emotional roller coaster. The, you know, the best way I can put it is, is that Real Talk Kim is a, a, a lot of flash, no substance. She's a lot of sizzle, but no steak. Yeah. So yeah, I think you get the idea. If you found this helpful, all the information on how you can share the video is down below in the description. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ and his vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins. Amen. Amen. <laughs>